we get started here, all of the PCAPs are available on this URL. So basically the blog slash 2018 slash labs and you should be able to find your way there. So the password is infected, all lowercase letters, uh, as usual for what I normally post on the blog. And uh, if you're working on a Windows laptop, be aware that uh, it, uh, there may be some issues with uh, your antivirus kicking in and deleting some of the PCAPs because they do contain malware. So please be aware. Uh, that's one thing I should have put as a prerequisite, not necessarily a prerequisite, because you can disable um, your near real-time protection, your real-time protection in Windows Defender or whatever it's called in Windows 10, and you can still uh, use the PCAPs. Another thing is um, you'll need to extract the PCAP files from the zip archive that contains all the PCAP files. Because in the Monday when I had the class, somebody was trying to just uh, open in Wireshark the PCAPs within the archive, and they were having a problem. So this is the URL. MalwareTrafficAnalysis.net slash 2018 slash labs. Go to the SharkFest directory and uh, password infected. Um, I will have the, I should have the slideshow available on there as well. I just don't have it available on there right now. Yeah, when you extracted it, well, yeah. Uh, the password is to, uh, uh, because it is password protected. Pa uh, it's, it's a password protected archive. The password is infected. So if um, you happen to forget it, the about page of the website has it in a graphic form. But it is infected. So please get that out because it will be uh, much, much easier and uh, much more fulfilling, I think, uh, for anyone participating if they actually have the PCAPs to play around with. Otherwise, it might be a little, um, a little less interactive. Does everybody have the URL? Because I'm going to move on. Raise your hand if you need a couple more seconds here to get that down. Oh. Password is infected. All lowercase letters. Uh, but enough about me. Let's jump into this Wireshark lab. This is analyzing uh, uh, Windows malware infection traffic. First, we're going to start with the Wireshark setup. Then we're going to look at host and user identification. And then I have four examples that uh, when I did this yesterday, I had uh, 15 minutes less and I got through the second web infection or the, the, the first web infection, the second infection. Some of the Wireshark setup that I'm going to talk about is available on my blog, but in the tutorial section, it basically just has to, to set up to add columns, look at HTTP hosts, get the SSL server name. Uh, it's a little out of date. The information in this presentation is a little more up to date. Let's look at Wireshark setup. We'll go through web traffic, the default Wireshark display, look at removing and adding columns, changing the date and time to UTC date and time, adding customs, uh, custom columns and hiding columns. We'll start with our first PCAP, 2018 SharkFest Traffic Analysis Lab 01.PCAP. There's nothing inherently malicious in this uh, PCAP, although it may trigger some alerts somewhere with some systems. Filter on HTTP.request and we can begin
show of hands, how many people are relatively new to Wireshark? Okay, <laughs> you're not relatively new, don't give me that. Oh, that's, that's true, relatively. All right, well, uh, HTTP.request. So when we look at HTTP.request, and I should, uh, I should start off uh, as we're getting set up here, it, uh, my viewpoint, uh, for what I'm uh, trying to show here is uh, really very much one person's view. And uh, so I tend to focus on commodity malware that has a uh, widespread distribution. The stuff that generally gets blocked by the spam filters because the criminals are going for quantity over quality. And hopefully, you know, that 0.1% that gets past the spam filters and somehow infects somebody's computer, uh, um, you know, you're able to, uh, as a criminal, I guess it, uh, it's a cost-effective solution. So uh, with any normal, uh, uh, normal environment that's adequately protected with firewalls and mail filtering, uh, some of these examples that we're going to look at here today, you're not going to normally see because it will be blocked. However, for frontline analysts that uh, don't get an opportunity to look at this activity, if you don't look at infection traffic, you're never not going to recognize it when you see it in a real world situation which is why I have the blog, which is why I do this sort of training and use this sort of material, because uh, in addition to being kind of uh, really interesting, uh, it's, it's good exposure to this type of traffic, especially if you've never seen it before. So HTTP.request, what we're looking at here is the unencrypted HTTP uh, requests, HTTP gets, posts, all these URLs that you would see that, that are not encrypted, that are not HTTPS. Now, if you look at the default Wireshark display, for the type of work that I do, I don't really care about stuff like the uh, column number. I don't, uh, I don't care about the, uh, uh, the frame length or the length of, in the frame dis, uh, display. And uh, as much as I appreciate what Wireshark can do for you, um, I don't really need it telling me the protocol. I will identify the protocol based on the, uh, uh, whether it's TCP or UDP and what the port is. Plus, uh, for example, if it's HTTP traffic and it's a non-standard HTTP port, I'm not going to see that port based on the protocol field. I think my, okay, here we go. Just a minute, got to make sure I get my laser pointer. So, uh, the first thing we're going to do, uh, we're going to remove some columns. But this is what I want to see. Oh, thank you. I, I'm good. Thank you, though. So, uh, I want to see the date and time in UTC. Uh, UTC, basically, if you're working in an organization that has a location in, uh, locations in more than one time zone, you need a standard time to, to set up. If you're a multinational uh, uh, company or organization, uh, you should probably standard, uh, standardize on a uh, standard time like UTC. When I was in the military, UTC was what we did all of our reporting on. I want to look at the source IP and the source port, destination IP, the destination port, HTTP host name, HTTPS server names, and that info column has a lot of good info, so I'm going to want to look at that. So let's talk about removing and adding columns in Wireshark. This amazingly versatile display that you can customize. Um, now keep in mind, this is my personal customization. I'll show you how I tend to set my Wireshark up. Uh, you don't necessarily need to delete or remove uh, permanent columns. If you want to keep them, you can just hide them. But I like to remove the number column. I, I know that uh, a lot of people here, a lot of the instructors here at uh, SharkFest, they generally use the number column, but I don't. Uh, when I'm looking at infection traffic and I've got to pull those indicators out, I don't really care what uh, uh, packet number in the PCAP is up there. So um, I'm going to get rid of it. You should be able to right click anywhere in the column. It'll bring up a menu, and at the very bottom of that menu is remove this column. That's the quickest, easiest way to remove a column. But remember, if you remove it, it's a little bit more of a pain to get it back. Uh, 
And let's do the same with protocol and link. Hide it if you want. Um, remove it if you're looking at it from my perspective. So once you remove those three columns, this is what your Wireshark display should look like if you're starting out with the default Wireshark display. So I've got the time, I've got the source, I've got the destination, and I've got the info lines. Normally what I'm looking at here is a lot of IP traffic, so uh, I'm generally not looking at ARP or anything uh, lower than the IP uh, layer. But I want to add some columns. Now that I've removed the ones that I don't want and that I know that I won't need, I'm going to add columns. And the, you have to, uh, to add columns, you've got to go to the column preferences menu. Now you can go to the file and preferences and work your way through there, but the easiest way to get to the column preferences menu is just to right click on any of the, in this, any of the column headers. It'll bring up the menu and you just go to column preferences. Boom, it'll take you right there. So if you're following along, this is what you should see. You're already directly in the columns section of Wireshark preferences. You've got your time, your source, your destination, your info. So with this, I want to add source port and destination port. So you click on the little red, uh, I'm sorry, the little, <laughs> there's nothing red about it. You click on the little plus sign in the lower left-hand portion of the screen. There's a plus and a minus, click on the plus sign. It will come up with a new column, titled new column, and the type is number. Double click in that new column listing you should be able to double click in it if you're working from a GUI. And you're going to change that to source port. Then you're going to double click on the number, double left click on the number, and it should come up with the menu. Scroll your, down way, your way down to source port unresolved. Now, the reason I use unresolved is because if I use the source port resolved, Wireshark might take it upon itself to not show me the port number, but show me what it thinks it resolves to. And once again, while I appreciate that Wireshark has the ability to do that, I don't necessarily want that for my day to day. So when you get done, you should have at the bottom of your display list, source port, SRC port unresolved. should be able to left click on that and drag it up to change the location of that column display. I'm going to put it right after source address. You're basically dragging and dropping it. So once you drag it up there after source address, this is what you should see. Time, source address, source port, destination address, and info. Now I want the destination port. So we'll do the same thing again. Click and a little plus sign, new column comes up, double click in the new column, name it destination port, double click on the number, uh, the column that shows the number, and uh, we're going to change that value to desk port unresolved. Once again, we're going to drag it up right after destination port. I'm sorry, destination address, destination port. Drag it up there. And this is what you should have. If anyone's having any problems getting there, please raise your hand. Please let me know. I don't want anybody to get uh, uh, behind. So if you have that, go back to your column display, 
and we're still filtered on HTTP.request, you're going to see this. You'll have your source port and your destination port. However, they're aligned to the right, unlike all the rest of the columns. So uh, with my anal retentive personality, that kind of annoys the heck out of me. So I gotta, I gotta align them to the left, just like everybody else. All you need to do is uh, within the, the particular column, within source port and within destination port, you just uh, right click in that column, align to the left. The same method that you would use to go the column preferences window, you just right click in the column, align left. And ah, that's much better. That looks a little neater in my mind. So now we have time, source IP, source port, destination IP, destination port, and info. All right, now we change the date and the time, uh, the time column to date and time in UTC. So it's relatively easy. Once you find this stuff, and uh, you've done it as often as I have, uh, it, it becomes second nature because you're, uh, you're, you're constantly reinstalling OSs and, and uh, dealing with the default uh, column display in Wireshark. So uh, go to View, Time Display Format, and you're going to change it from second since beginning of the capture to UTC date and time of day. There's also a keyboard shortcut, but I'm going by the GUI here, by the menus. Uh, you can hit Control-Alt-F7 if you're in Windows on the most recent versions of Wireshark. So once you do that, your time will change. And now I can see, based on the column display of the frames that we have displayed, this is 2018, uh, uh, January 6th. However, the seconds are displayed well past the fidelity that I need. And it's taking up valuable uh, space on my screen. So I want to uh, resolve that only down to the second. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to do the same thing. View, time display format. So just like we changed it uh, to UTC date and time of day, we're going to change the uh, resolution from uh, automatic to seconds. And once you do that, ah, it looks much better. So we're getting closer. We're getting closer to the, the, the desired end state that I would like to see when I'm looking at PCAPs reviewing them for Windows malware traffic. So unlike the source port and unlike the destination port, uh, there are certain columns that I want to see that are not part of the default uh, ports, uh, I'm sorry, default column listings from the column preferences. Fortunately, in Wireshark, you can go to the frame details window and you can basically apply any uh, section as a column. Some are more useful than others, but the ones that I want to see are the HTTP host names and the HTTPS server names. So we're still on the first PCAP. We're still filtered on HTTP.request. So in the frame details window, just below the column display, you may have to kind of move it up so you see everything. That was another thing I realized as I was uh, as I've te taught this class. Some some people have this part just like pulled all the way down. That you'll need to uh, get in that middle section. So in the frame details, it pretty much goes all the way from the frame level up uh, to transport level, and in, in this case, the application layer. And uh, you'll see Hypertext Transfer Protocol. Just uh, left click on that uh, little arrow. Instead of having it go to the right, you have it go down. You're expanding it. And then underneath there, you should find the host, the, the value of the host that says Newegg.com. So you're going to left click on that to select it. And then you're going to right click on it so you'll bring up a menu. And in that menu, about two-thirds of the way up, 
or one third of the way down, however you look at it, if you're an optimist or if you're a pessimist, uh, you'll see apply as column. When you uh, select that and apply it as column, this should be what you have. So now if I filter on HTTP.request, I can literally see everything uh, uh, that I would if you're, say, example, for example, if you're looking at a, uh, uh, a, uh, a web server proxy login, it's called all the URLs listed. But I've got more information here because not only do I have the uh, URL information, I've got the IP addresses and the ports and the source ports and the destination, uh, I'm sorry, source ports and source IPs should I need it. So now that I have the HTTP host names, I want to look at the HTTPS server names. So even though, uh, in general, there, there's not too much information that you can get from HTTPS traffic that's uh, relevant to the type of uh, indicators that I'm trying to pull out of a PCAP, HTTPS server names, I may not get the URL, but at least I can get, uh, in normal circumstances, I can get that domain that they're contacting. So in this case, we'll filter on ssl.handshake.type equals one. So for your basic Wireshark filtering, you can use two equal signs or you could use the letters EQ, which means the same thing. You can't, apparently, uh, 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 for whatever reason, you can't just use a single equal sign, you gotta use two equal signs. So if you filter, on this first PCAP, on ssl.handshake.type equals one. Should be pretty much just a uh, bluish purple uh, list in your column display and everything in the info column should say client hello. Everybody able to get to this? And once again, please don't be shy about raising your hand if uh, 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 you missed something along the way. So, now that we have this, we're going to, you probably have to drag this up a bit because I want to look at the frame uh, uh, details in the middle part of your default workshop uh, preference, the way it's displayed. This very first SSL handshake type equals one, that very first frame that's listed in the column display should be frame 29 but it doesn't really matter what frame it is because we're going to get there the same way. We're going to click on Secure Sockets Layer. Go down to that, there should be TLS v1.2 right under that. You're gonna expand that. Below that is Handshake Protocol, colon, client, hello. Well, hello there. Gonna expand that. Under that, you scroll down far enough, you should see extension server name. And we're gonna expand that. Under that, you should see server name indication extension. We're gonna expand that. And finally, finally, after working your way all the way down through there, we find the server name, which should be www.newegg.com. Anybody not able to find this? I, I see people scratching their head, you know, just reaching up for an itch. It's like, oh, oh, wait, no, false alarm. Once again, we're going to left click on that value to select it. We're gonna right click on it to apply as column. And ah, now we're still filtered on SSL handshake type equals one. And we have a new column right by that host column that we made. We'll have the server name column. You see www.newegg.com followed by lots of other names. Yes? I did not know that. What, the, the HTTPS and HTTPS server name? Oh, cool. I'll have to get with you after that, after this, uh, so I can uh, do that and then update the course of my uh, training here because that would be very, very good. 
Uh, one of the things I will say is, uh, for example, on my day-to-day, -day, uh, I'll use a Debian distro and uh, whatever uh, uh, version of Wireshark, it's a 2.x, I think it's 2.4, maybe 2.2. Uh, um, so I know with uh, 2.6, we've got a lot of improvements that actually make some of what I'm going through, like when we're talking about the HTTP host and the server name, I've always looked at them you know, for a long while now as separate values, separate columns. But if we can include them in one column, that would definitely make things much easier. Gotcha. So now, I may not want to look at all of those columns all of the time. So we can hide columns. For example, whenever I'm investigating uh, traffic that I've pulled on a particular host, a Windows client, for example, that got infected, I'm going to search on the IP address. If I've got access to pull packet capture, I'm going to pull just on that one IP address. So for web traffic, that should, since that's the client, the client almost always initiates the TCP connections when you're talking about web traffic, web-based traffic. So the source port, in this case, if you look at everything, whether it's HTTP request or SSL server, uh, handshake type equals one, the source IP address should, for this PCAP, read 172.16.1.116. You got a bunch of different source ports because we're talking about uh, a bunch of different TCP streams based on those port pairs. But uh, I don't need to be constantly reminded and taking up uh, uh, you know screen real estate uh, that I'm looking at the source IP address there. So I generally, when I'm looking at stuff, I will hide the source IP and I will hide the source port. It's easy enough to do. You right click on the column header and then there should be check marks on the columns that you want to display you just click on the check mark to uncheck it gets rid of the source port as you see here we'll do the same I'm sorry source IP and then the source port will do the same thing now here's what we have if you've been following along with this, we've got time, destination IP, destination port, host, which is the HTTP host, the server name, which is the HTTPS server name, and we've got the info line. So now that we've gotten that, I generally filter if I want to have a good idea of what's going on web traffic wise in a PCAP. SSL handshake type equals one or HTTP request. Now it doesn't tell me every, everything, but it's a good way of looking at a PCAP and getting a, uh, uh, a kind of a uh, log listing type display of what we're seeing in a particular PCAP. So this is kind of my go-to when I'm looking at a PCAP and I want to see what's going on web-wise, web traffic-wise. I want to make a quick mention of uh, one of the online tools that you use to help you get information from the PCAP. It's packettotal.com. Packettotal, all one word, dot com. So you can submit your PCAPs to packettotal.com and it will break a lot of this information out for you. There are other Wireshark tools that you can use like a, 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 a Netminer. And uh, some of the other, uh, there, there's other tools that you can get, commercial grade tools, where you can go through and uh, 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 sift through and organize all this information from the PCAP. But uh, um, it either it requires the installation of another program, or it, um, it, it just ends up being something that uh, I would rather uh, offload to an online tool, so to speak. Now keep in mind, because this is an online tool, if you submit a PCAP to packet total, somebody else could actually retrieve that PCAP. Like uh, if you submit a piece of malware to virus total, if somebody has access to virus total intelligence and they know the file hash of your particular piece of malware, they could grab that. So from what I understand on virus total, there's been classified US government documents that have appeared in virus total. And uh, 
Lord knows, I, hopefully nothing that bad has happened on a uh, packet total. But let's look, uh, you can drag and drop the second PCAP in our lab into packet total. So please do that real quick if you would be so kind. You can look at the results. Now there are several tabs that you can generally go through. You look at the connections, you can look at uh, all sorts of stuff. This is a relatively sparse PCAP. It doesn't have too much in it. It doesn't have anything uh, uh, other than, uh, I want to say, a, a uh, redirect URL and then all the um, traffic that's going back and forth for, in this case, rig exploit kit. So you, in this case, this particular PCAP has a malicious activity tab, and you can look at signatures that would trigger on the emerging threats open rule set. In this case, you should have several alerts that uh, show up under that malicious activity tab that state rig exploit kit or rig EK, ET current events. Yes, sir? This is the lab right? that was something. Yes, this is uh, the second lab. If you submit the first lab, you, you probably get some interesting stuff, but uh, it's not, it's not going to be this stuff. So what I would uh, encourage you guys to do is, uh, especially if you're starting out new to Wireshark, uh, but uh, even if you're not, if you haven't used Packet Total, try it out. If nothing else, uh, even if there's no malicious activity in it, uh, some of the stuff that we'll go through, uh, finding, you know, digging in through Wireshark, making uh, other custom columns and finding this information, you can find that using Packet Total, almost in the same manner that Net, uh, Netminer uh, uh, parses out uh, data from a PCAP. So one thing I want to uh, mention here is I always have a, a segment on hosting user identification when I do these labs. Because if something happens and you're investigating, you have to, uh, if it's an incident, you got to be able to accurately and concisely report what happened. All right? The first thing that you need to do is you need to note the exact time that you think it happened. I guess the first thing you do is you confirm that whatever happened actually happened, right? But uh, once you've confirmed that it is malicious activity, your first thing is the when. At some time, on some date, to somebody. So the second thing is the who. Then this happened to them, right? Because it doesn't matter what happened in a particular PCAP if I don't know what time, if you didn't tell me what time it happened, if you didn't tell me who it happened to, that information, you know, somebody got infected is like, well, that tells me a lot. You know, there's not really much I can do about it. I need to know what, who, and when. In that order, when you're writing an incident report, if you're reporting on this stuff and passing that information along, it should always go what? I'm sorry, when, who, what? Generally, if we get an alert, an alert has a timestamp on it. So you've got your what right there. However, the hardest thing in a, a lot of traffic network traffic investigations is determining who is associated with a particular infected Windows client. So if we're looking at host info, we can find out a lot about it. We may not find out exactly who, but we would have more information about that host. So we can find out a lot about a host through a MAC address because Wireshark um, and, and that's one of the features that I really enjoy in Wireshark is how it breaks out that uh, those first three, uh, um, what are they? I don't want to say octets. Yeah, thank you. First three bytes. I get so. Uh, anyway, first three bytes. How it breaks it up into the uh, into the Mac uh, the vendor ID for that particular Mac address. So that's awesome. Just by knowing the MAC address, you can uh, at least, oh, is it an Apple product? Is it uh, something else? Is, is it a, uh, a Samsung product, which is probably an Android-based deal? Uh, the IP address will generally, if we get an alert on something, we're already searching on the IP address, so we generally know what the IP address is. But we may not know what the associated host name is for any one of these types of devices we could be investigating if we're looking at an alert. So please open 
the third PCAP. We should always have a little bit of background here. So let's just say for the sake of argument, and we'll get to the actual alert later, but we got something suspicious happening on IP address 10.1.10.127. So that's our Windows client in this case. You, uh, in this scenario, you're working for a company called PinnacleFlux.com. And the domain controller in this environment, in this Windows environment, the domain uh, controller, the, uh, the Active Directory server, is PinnacleFlux-DC. And this network segment is uh, 10.1.10.0/24. That's the, uh, I always say sitter. Is it cider? Cider. Kidder. <laughs> anyway, I, w I was surprised when I first started out how many people did not use this. Uh, when I was doing government contracting work, people would do, uh, oh, 10.1.10.1 dash 10.1.10.255. It's like, well, you could write it so much simpler if you knew cider. Not if you drank cider. All right, so uh, one of the ways, uh, the first way we're going to run through how to get a host name from traffic is through DHCP traffic. Now with these uh, PCAPs that I generally uh, make for these courses, you'll notice that, especially on this one, the very first frame in your column display when you filter on boot P, which is, uh, it was funny, for the longest time, I was like, I type in DHCP, it does nothing. <laughs> and uh, so I, for the longest time, even uh, uh, through Monday, I was like, UDP port equals 67, or UDP port equals 68. That's how you get there. You know, not realizing that, oh, it tells you right here it's bootstrap protocol. You know, uh, I just, boot P is such an older term uh, that I didn't even think to try it. And then Monday, somebody says, hey, you know you could use boot P. And I'm like, oh, gee, good Lord. So I literally, as I've gone through uh, uh, teaching workshops, uh, you know, this year and last, going through this sort of stuff, I've been saying, I think even here, last year here, UDP port equals 67, nobody said anything. Nobody told me. It's like, hey, Brad, you know you can do this easier. So please, call me on my BS. If I'm up here and I'm going through something that I've been doing for years, and uh, you guys know a simpler way of doing it or a more accurate way of doing it, please raise your hand, correct me right away, so I can update this material. So, Boot P, we're looking at DHCP traffic. We're going to look at uh, bootstrap protocol. We're going to expand that part in the frame details. And go all the way down to an option, in this case, in that first frame where it shows that it has an IP address of 0.0.0.0 .0 .0 as it connects, as it starts that boot P process, that DHCP process to get an IP address it identifies itself. It tells what the host name is. You don't always see the host name in DHCP traffic, but sometimes you do. In this case, we see Wentworth-PC. Anybody not able to find this? There it is a little more clearly. Should really have that pop up at the same time. Oh, and there are probably some other slides where uh, I, uh, uh, instead of using boot P, I may still have UDP port equals 67 typed up there. So please take that with a grain of salt. Anyway, you can also look for a Windows host in an Active Directory environment, and even not in an Active Directory environment, but like in a home network where it's just your computer and you're not. You're not logging in, you're at home, you don't have a login. You just go straight to Windows when you power up. You're still going to see NetBIOS name service traffic, uh, the same general type of stuff when a Windows host uh, uh, connects to a network, connects to whatever your internal LAN address space is, whether it's a, a corporate environment or whether it's your home network. So, are you saying that we should see this Pardon? 
I'm not even going that deep. I'm just saying you should see NB and S packets. Uh, uh, if you filter on NB and S. Oh. Uh, DHCP, that's, uh, that's something different. I've uh, got this relatively uh, uh, somewhat crafted, I guess, for this course to kind of illustrate how, okay, the host, when it uh, goes through the DHCP process, it doesn't have an IP address, and then it gets one when the uh, DHCP server at 10.1.10.254 replies back and says, you're this. Yeah, sometimes I have to really finagle things in my uh, virtual environment as I'm trying to generate these PCAPs to get something that uh, uh, closely resembles what you might see in the real world, and, and then kind of balance that with uh, you know trying to get the point across. So, back to NetBIOS name service traffic. Please filter on NBNS. In this case, I'm showing uh, source, uh, source port, destination, destination port, and info. And you can generally correlate quite easily with the Windows host the MAC address for any particular frame that you're on. So you got the MAC address. This is a Hewlett Packard uh, based MAC address. So it's a Windows host, probably a Hewlett Packard laptop or a desktop. It's at 10.1.10.127. And the host name at the very beginning of the NBNS traffic for the registration entry shows as Wentworth-PC. You also see Pinnacle Flux. It's showing as registration, but that's the domain controller. That's the domain it's logging on to. Now, here's the deal. Here's the thing, I should say. If you're investigating an alert on network traffic and you're pulling this data, you somehow have access to full packet data, right? And you got an alert, but somebody's been online, has been logged in for like six, seven hours already. Uh, you probably won't see the initial registration. And uh, I, heaven help you if you're trying to pull seven hours of data from somebody that's logged on to a, a corporate network. It's a, it's a lot of stuff. Um, so you may have to do two separate queries. You know, and, and double check to make sure that that IP address hasn't been used by somebody before. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of things uh, that you have to worry about in, in the real world that uh, these PCAPs really really simplify. Also, you can go to the frame details when you're looking at NBNS traffic and any one of those registration entries where we're looking at Wentworth PC, and it correlate you can correlate the name to the address in the additional record on that very first frame of the NBNS results. If you go into the frame details, scroll down to additional records, you should be able to find this particular information. So for Windows hosts, especially in an Active Directory environment, uh, uh, it's relatively easy to figure out a host name. And in Wireshark in general, it's really easy to correlate a uh, MAC address with an IP address. So it's really the user info, the person's name. You know, who is it that's actually using this computer? All right, it says, in this case, it says Wentworth-PC. So maybe it's somebody whose name, last name is Wentworth. Or maybe they're just a big fan of that J.G. Wentworth commercial that was uh, uh, all the rage a few years back. 877 cash now, baby. So in this case, in many cases, um, a Windows account name, if you're logging in, uh, could very well be first name dot last name, which is how I have it in my scenarios for the most part. Sometimes you'll see first initial last name. Sometimes you log in with an employee number. Somebody had mentioned that yesterday. Is there any other methods, any other that I haven't mentioned here that you guys use uh, to log in, you know, with your uh, with your Windows laptop somewhere? Those are about the only thing I can think. Three things that I can think of off the top of my head. First initial, last name. First, yeah, very, very yes. That and that seems to be very common as well. But for the purposes of this lab. 
and the PCAPs I have here, it should always be first name dot last name for this particular training. So we're going to look at the Kerberos authentication traffic that should have the value of that Windows user account. How do we find it? We filter on Kerberos.CNameString. From what I understand, this is case sensitive. So please filter on that. You should see a lot of stuff going back and forth on TCP port 88, which is very much a Cabrero's port. And you see a lot of values in the info column that are AS-REQ, AS-REP, TGS-REP, and so forth. By default, you should be on the first frame uh, result in that column display. Stay on there. Go to the frame details section at the very bottom. Expand your way down through Kerberos, ASREQ, REQ body, C name and C name string. Hang it. So on that very first frame, when we're looking at that data in the frame details, you should see C name string colon Wentworth PC with a dollar sign at the end. So if it's a, a Windows host name for that C name value, it's going to end in the dollar sign. If it's a user account name, it will not have a dollar sign at the end. So I used to de uh, teach, uh, okay, filter on Kerbero C name string, and Kerbero C name string does not equal or does not contain a dollar sign. And it's a quick way to get that stuff. But uh, an easier way to do it through your column display without having to type all that is to apply this C name string value as a column and have a separate column that you could scroll through to quickly find the Windows user account name. So this is something that's also that I've started doing within the last year is just have a C name string column So if you do that, your C name string column should appear right by the info column. Scroll all the way down to the bottom, and you should find a user account name of myung.wentworth. Anybody not able to find this? So myung.wentworth is the user account name. So now we know, uh, we know the host information that we need to know. We know the Windows user account. Uh, in this case, first name, dot last name. So now we know who to contact to get that, uh, to get that laptop or desktop re-imaged. So now that we've got our column display set up in such a way that we could easily review the traffic, and now that we know how to identify a host and user information, uh, let's look at the actual infection traffic, some examples. So we're still on the third PCAP. We're still looking at this information on the, the network parameters, network segment. So what I generally do, uh, if I want to generate alerts for the purposes of a uh, uh, of a training lab or uh, just to, uh, for the traffic analysis exercises that I post on my blog, I'll use Security Onion and uh, I've got access to the Emerging Threats Pro uh, signature set. So uh, due to the blog and the work that I had done there, they, uh, they actually let me have access to that so I can use it and generate alerts uh, for the blog entries. I don't do it as much now on the alert side as I used to uh, but I generally do uh, accomplish some of that for the exercises and for training like this. So I can uh, drag this PCAP over to my Security Onion VM, use TCP replay, port it to the monitoring uh, Ethernet port, 
and boom, I can see all the uh, alerts that this traffic would generate. So, in this case, we have a scenario. We have a scenario if you were monitoring a uh, SIM or looking at alerts, reviewing alerts in your corporate environment, and you run across this stuff, we've got LockyBot. Now, I know it's called LokiBot, but you have to bear with me. I've been calling it LockyBot for so long, I, I can't help myself. Yes, I know it's Loki. So, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to filter on HTTP requests based on this IP address that these alerts are triggering on. So what we're going to do, that, that kind of got messed up there, we're going to do HTTP.request and IP.ADDR equals 176.123.0.55. If you're talking about port 80 traffic, this should generally be HTTP traffic, especially in the case of uh, Windows malware infections. So using HTTP request and pairing it with the IP address related to the alert should give you a quick and dirty display of what's going on. So you see a bunch of HTTP requests. They're all posts. They all end, well, they all have the same URL. But one of the things I will say about LokiBot is that the URLs generally tend to end in fre.php. Now I say this, and I had an example yesterday where it was ended with fred.php. And it's like, oh, son of a gun. Now, I've been seeing like dozens of these in the past few months where they all ended, all those URLs ended in uh, fre.php. And in this case, the host name's always different. Uh, almost every infection I run across has a different host name. They'll, uh, they'll set up uh, fraud servers or servers quickly through fraud accounts and set it up for command and control. So this is LokiBot, LokiBot, command and control traffic uh, going back to that server and that domain on 176.123.0.55. So on that first frame result, um, let's follow the TCP stream. So left click on it to select it right click to bring up a menu and there should be somewhere in the middle you can follow TCP stream or follow HTTP stream what I generally tend to do is I will almost always follow TCP stream first now following HTTP stream is very useful if uh, the data that you're looking at for a web page is uh, gzip compressed if you follow TCP stream it's going to uh, look like a bunch of garbage. If you follow HTTP stream, it will have that displayed uh, unzipped, as it were. Those are the ah, excellent. That is very nice. Yeah, I can't tell you how much I appreciate not having to export a uh, HTTP page now in order to quickly look at something. But in this case, let's uh, follow the TCP stream for that first frame result. And this is what you should see. So one of the identifying features of LokiBot, one of the things that we see, and somebody asked me, is this a normal user agent string by, from some other application that generates this sort of HTTP traffic? And all I can say is, I don't know. It may be. All I know is, whenever I see it, in the circles I walk. Anytime I see that Charon Inferno, I think, ah, oh, it's probably LokiBot. So this has remained amazingly consistent, and uh, the Emerging Threats rules uh, has a rule for LokiBot that triggers based on that string value in the user agent string. And you'll also see that, oh, we've got this data. It's actually exfiltrating data to that command control server, saying, okay, here's the user account name. Here's a, um, you know, Wentworth PC on Pinnacle Flux, some of the other data. And there's probably other stuff in here that's, uh, you know, listed in the bytes that I'm, uh, in the actual hex code that I'm not uh, able to cover here. And you always see it return from the re server. will always come back and say 404 not found. 
Now what this doesn't mean is it doesn't mean that the server did not get the data. It just means that it's saying, hey, 404 not found, and it's not returning anything. It's saying file not found, but it's actually getting this data. Well, that's LokiBot. That's what LokiBot post-infection traffic looks like. Now, for this particular PCAP, we have some additional alerts that are policy-based. So we're seeing an executable being downloaded over HTTP. And this executable is actually smaller than one megabyte, which is very common for Windows-based malware. So um, just because you have a Windows executable file being sent over HTTP and it's smaller than one megabyte does not mean by itself that that's malware. But it is highly suspicious, and it's always worth checking out, especially if we see this, and then we see a bunch of post-infection alerts very well could possibly be, uh, this could be the LokiBot malware binary. So let's find out. We're going to take this IP address. We're going to do the same thing we did for the LokiBot alerts on this IP. We're going to filter. But I also want to look at the HTTP responses. So here's another one for you. For the longest time, I was doing HTTP request or HTTP response, putting them in parentheses, and IP address equals this. And then Monday somebody said, hey, you know you can do it at HTTP, and I just hit my head and I was like, oh yeah. I knew it, I just didn't realize it. Yeah. I, yeah, so you can see here, I've actually got it <laughs> in, the real, in the real filter, but uh, you should be able to use HTTP, not have to type out so much. For all practical intents and purposes, you can use HTTP, and the IP address equals 23.249.161.84. You got your HTTP host column displayed, you should see worldcup77.ddns.net. If I see anything from something.ddns.net, I'm like, eh, that's odd. Probably malware which anytime I see it, it pretty much is. And we can look at the URL. You could, uh, you could reconstruct the URL by using the host name and then putting the rest of the uh, information after the get. So this is what that URL would look like in a, uh, uh, a web proxy log. And since I got, the, I literally generated this traffic on the Saturday before I came out here, so as far as I know, this very much, this very well could be active. You can literally take that and type that in your browser. You may very well get some malware. And uh, as a note, be careful because this is real malware that we're dealing with here. I don't want anybody that's on a Windows computer to get infected. I will deny all responsibility. So we can look, uh, looking at the HTTP response uh, code, we can see a 200 OK and it comes back in the server. The server that's hosting this file identifies it as an application slash MS download, which is common for Windows executable files. Not the most common, but it's something that I occasionally see. So this is all the same TCP stream. Follow the TCP stream from either one of those frames. And if you haven't seen this yet, if you haven't seen a Windows executable file in HTTP traffic in Wireshark from a PCAP, uh, you know, it, welcome. I'm uh, happy to have you in this uh, select uh, group of individuals. Because it's uh, rare that people actually use Wireshark if we're talking about the population at large. And within the population that does use Wireshark, it tends to be more for network-based troubleshooting than for looking at uh, uh, malware traffic. And at least for the time being, it is much more common to see Windows malware hosted on a server that's just using straight HTTP as opposed to HTTPS. Now we're moving in the direction of HTTPS more and more all the time. However, it is, um, even if it's not that much harder to actually establish an HTTPS server, 
these guys are generally working in volume, working in bulk. So uh, any steps you can do to kind of get that malware out there and eliminate some unnecessary steps, such as just setting up an HTTP server without any sort of uh, encryption to have it run HTTPS, then uh, you'll see that happen. With LokiBot, with the criminals behind LokiBot, this is uh, really quite common. What they do occasionally have uh, uh, the binaries are encoded or somehow encrypted sometimes when they come over the wire. In this case, we can follow the TCP stream and we can see some indicators that this is a Windows executable program. We don't know at this point if it is uh, malicious or not. We'll find that out a little bit later. But uh, the, first two, the first two bytes of a Windows executable file and a Windows DLL file are they, they are represented by the ASCII characters MZ. So if you see MZ, if you see something like this program must be run under Win32, and then the server is so kind as to correctly identify it as something that looks like it might be a Windows executable, then hey, we got something going on here. And it's about 622, uh, 623 kilobytes. So we got a Windows executable here. Now you can actually filter uh, a quick and easy way in a PCAP if you want to see if there's any Windows executables in it or DLLs or whatever. You can just put IP contains this program in quotation marks uh, and it's uh, case sensitive. You have to put it in quotation marks because there's a space in there. The most common one that I see is this program cannot be run in DOS mode. It shows up as a string of characters when you're looking at that TCP stream. The, this one, you know, when I generate the traffic, it's like, oh, this, this is something I don't see not nearly as much. It's almost always this program cannot be run in DOS mode. But either way, this program catches both. Yes. And it may catch even more. It may catch stuff that's not even a... Windows executable, depending on what you have in your PCAP. Yes, sir. Uh, question here. If you go back to the TCP stream, the content type uh, application slash X. MS download, download, yes. That uh, would be, uh, would you need both the, the, those two signatures present to indicate the uh, Windows executable? Or just in, in either one? Would well, realistically, the, it's what you see after the headers that will confirm whether or not. If you see that MZ, if you see this program must be run under Win32, even if the content type says like image slash PNG, which is a common uh, thing that I'll see out in the, in the, in the wild for malware delivery, uh, yeah, I mean, th this is just an indicator, right? Uh, nothing more, nothing less. By itself, it, uh, it, all, it, all you can tell by that is that the server has identified it as this type of file. Right. The server says what they're sending. Exactly. Yes. Now, what I will say is a lot of times when I see malware, it, it usually comes across as application slash octet stream. Octet dash stream. So that's the most common one that I see with malware. Application octet stream. Yes, sir. The critical thing is the first bytes would be because without the first two bytes, would it still execute? Even if you discard the content type, because the content type you put anything. I think so, yeah. It, it's all part of the format. I, I can tell you every single one that I've seen has always uh, started with MZ, and uh, as I understand it, I'm getting some other uh, head nods here. So I'm not a reverse engineer, and I, I'm definitely not a programmer. So uh, I cannot answer with authority. I can answer with uh, uh, fairly certainty. Anyway, this is a, a quick and uh, dirty way of, when you have a peek at to see if any Windows executable files are passed in the clear, or, or one of the ways. This is how I generally do it. I say, oh, I'll do it. Now, that doesn't mean that if I don't get any results that it still might not be passed. It just is a, if, if I get the results and I follow that TCP stream and I see that, it's like, I've got a Windows executable. Let's see if I can export that Windows executable file from the PCAP. That way I can submit it to Virus Total, or I can uh, more, more likely, if you're following best security practices, I would extract that 
that, uh, that binary, that executable, I would uh, uh, normally work from a Linux environment or maybe a MacBook and just do a, uh, uh, I'd do first I do a file command to confirm that it is a uh, Windows executable file. And then I would do a uh, SHA, uh, uh, SHA sum command to get the SHA-256 hash. And then I would check that against virus total. Because you never know. Something, if you run into a Windows executable, it could be malware associated with a targeted attack. And if that is the case, if you have any doubt whatsoever, you don't want to submit that file to VirusTotal because then you've just announced that the crim criminals are monitoring VirusTotal, which they probably are, to double check to make sure nobody's discovered them. They can easily see that their malware has been submitted. And if they're only targeting you, they know that you know. So then they'll adjust accordingly. So a best security practice when you're investigating this stuff is not to submit the file itself to VirusTotal, but to get a file hash on it and search VirusTotal for the file hash. And if it's already there, then yeah, that's fine. And in the case of this stuff, this junk, this commodity malware, uh, you know, it's fine. And, and uh, you know, I've seen enough of this stuff that I, I have a, a very good sense of uh, what's generally commodity malware, but if I have any question, I'm not going to submit it directly to virus total. But enough of that, let's actually extract this from the PCAP, which if you're running a Windows laptop with Windows 10, without that antivirus disabled, I'm sure this will probably pick it up rather quickly, which it already has in uh, at least yesterday. So file, export objects, HTTP. The second result in the HTTP object list should be that file. Now what's interesting is the file name that shows in this column is always going to be either the URL or the last part of the URL. All right, so this URL actually was kind enough to, you know, basically just label the malware as it was. Um, however, if it could be just some unidentified string, random string of characters, and if you got a very long URL, which I've seen, and it's got a bunch of backslashes or forward slashes or whatever in it, all you're going to get for the default file name, and when you save that, you have to left click on it to select it, and then you save it. But um, you can change the name to whatever you want. If you're on a Windows laptop, you can name it something.bin, change that .exe to .bin and then you won't have to worry about accidentally clicking on it. However, I would just recommend that you don't work from a Windows laptop if you're doing this sort of investigation, if you can avoid it. Anyway, you can submit that to VirusTool, you can submit the file to uh, Sandbox Tools, you can confirm if it's uh, actually generating some of the post-infection traffic. Yes, sir? Pardon? File, export objects, HTTP. So this is one that I commonly use as well. Because more often than not, Windows malware, if it's being distributed, uh, you know, somehow a, a uh, Word document that has a malicious macro grabs the malware, more often than not, it's going to be on some HTTP server somewhere probably a legitimate website that was compromised and is hosting malware, and then they'll just grab it in the clear. Ah, well, that's uh, Windows, right? Yep, yep there you go. Um, so uh, I, I need to, uh, I was talking to some of the other guys, it's like, uh, if you have Windows, uh, you know, maybe get um, uh, virtual box, or uh, I always argue for, uh, if you're going to use VMware, do the paid version, because it's, uh, in my personal opinion, it's worth it, even though it is a little bit pricey to get VMware Workstation for Windows. Uh, talking what, I think it's like 200 bucks US. So LokiBot is generally distributed through email. So since we saw that Windows executable come over, there was probably some email attachment or some email that had a link or something that uh, uh, caused the, the, the victim host 
to get to it. In this case, uh, we're going to look at a web-based infection where there's no emails involved. This will be the Net Support Manager RAT. Open up your fourth PCAP. In that fourth PCAP, here are our network parameters. This is not in an Active Directory environment. Just picture this as somebody at home on their Windows 7 computer that they refuse to upgrade to Windows 10 because they don't like how it looks or how it acts or how it spies on you. So we're in the 192.168.100.0/24 range. Here are the alerts that we get. So for Net Support Manager RAT, now this is a, a legitimate tool in that it's by itself, it's not a, a malware. It's how it's being used in this case. So uh, any sort of remote access tool, uh, somebody could make the argument that as a system administrator that they use it in their work environment. However, realistically, I want to say for the vast majority of things that you would have to administer in a Windows environment, you should be able to do it through the normal internal Windows tools. A rat would just make things easier, especially if you're used to doing it that way. But uh, I don't know. If I see a Net Support Manager uh, a remote access tool in any environment, I'm like, I, I just assume it's uh, malware related. Very least, it's shady. So we've got 179.43.191.170 on a non-standard HTTP port. TCP port 2259. We have a couple of policy alerts. We have, they're all policy alerts. And they're saying that this is the net support remote access tool. OK? Not inherently malicious, but you might want to keep an eye on it. Notice how the ones on top you see socking, S-O-C-E-N-G. For the alerts, uh, that's a uh, contraction of social engineering. And then we see a, a uh, something identified as a Trojan. There's an HTTP post uh, to a GIF file, which is a little odd if you're reading that and you haven't looked at the traffic. So here's how we see the Net Support Manager rat being distributed this campaign, if you will, that the bad guys are running to try and infect normal people like you and me. You have a website, a legitimate website, and like many legitimate websites out there, it may not be 100% uh, uh, up to date on its patches or its software version. So uh, there is an incredibly large amount of vulnerable hosts out there on today's internet they're just waiting to be compromised if they're not already compromised and hosting some sort of malware. Or in this case, you got a compromised web uh, site, New Rochelle Talk, N-E-W-R-O-C-H-E-L-L-E, -L -L -E, talk.com. If you put that into your browser right now, you would probably get this that would pop up because there's an injected script in that site that uh, kicks off a uh, process, a chain of URLs that leads to this. So you have something that says, hey, you're using an older version of Chrome, which are realistically, come on, if you got Chrome, it updates itself whether you want it to or not. So this is already operating under a bad assumption for anybody who has any sort of knowledge about how Chrome works. And uh, you know, it comes up and it says, OK, uh, and Chrome will tell you, hey, this type of file could harm your computer. Do you want to keep it anyway? Yeah, me, I'm like, yeah. And in this case, the, the file name itself, and I should have expanded that, is Chrome underscore 72.3.28.js. So it's a script file. Windows script host will execute that file and do what it says. So here are the chain of events for this particular chain of infection that we see in this PCAP, in this fourth PCAP. You got that legitimate website that is compromised and it has injected script. 
In this case, I want to say it's either right before the opening HTML tag or right after the closing HTML tag. If you go to the HTTP, filter on HTTP.request, find the first one, it's a little ways down, uh, the first uh, URL to uh, Rochelle, New Rochelle Talk, uh, dot com or whatever it is, um, and you follow the HTTP stream, you should be able to find that injected code. Now, I want to say it's before the opening HTML tag. When I say injected code, it's just code that the authors and the, the system administrator doesn't want to be there, but because it's a compromised site, the bad guys set it up so whenever somebody looks at a page on that site, that they'll have extra code injected into that page. And that will kick off a chain of events that leads to the fake SOC Eng social engineering page that tries to pass itself off as a Chrome update. You'll get some ad URLs, you know, the fake Chrome update page, the JS uh, file from a Dropbox URL, because it's hosted on Dropbox, because criminals love uh, abusing uh, Google, uh, free storage, and Dropbox, and any number of uh, free hosting services. I don't see that, unfortunately, changing. So we got our alerts on some of the URLs on that fake Chrome update page. And we have some of the alerts on, after this infection process happened, the post-infection traffic for Net Support Manager. So let's go back to our list of alerts. And we're going to filter on that uh, PCAP. We're going to filter HTTP request and IP address equals 179.43.191.170. Or consequently, you can filter on HTTP request and tcp.port equals 2259. In this case, I filtered on the TCP port. They get the same thing either way. When we look at the results in our column display, all those frames that are displayed that show the HTTP requests, we'll see that there is no actual host name. In HTTP traffic, if there's no host name, you'll generally see the IP address. If you're filtering, if it's somehow HTTPS traffic, and there's no host name, there's no actual host that's going directly to an IP address, and you're getting that HTTPS traffic, it's, that, that column will be blank. There won't be an IP address in general, from what I've seen. And it's, uh, this is also kind of weird, and there's a post, and then you see an HTTP colon backslash backslash, which, you know, it, it's like a URL as part of the URL the way it shows up here. So, uh, once again, it's not malicious on its own, but I rarely see this except for Net Support Manager traffic. But once again, that's that's the circles I run in. Yes? Yes, and, and that is proxy traffic. That is, I'm sorry, uh, you'll see this with proxy traffic. You are exactly correct. So let's uh, follow any one of these uh, TCP streams here or any one of those results. And this should be what you would see. What I will say is up until, uh, so the criminals that are running this campaign, when they use Net Support Manager RAT, they're using an older version, because I th still think you would have to pay for it if you were using it legitimately. So uh, they use some out of date uh, uh, executable file that's like several versions older. And uh, up and through uh, April of this year, it was an older version where the data that was being sent was not encoded. So you would see, okay, here's the host name, here's all this other information on your uh, host, but now you'll see data and you'll just see a string of uh, garbage because it is uh, somehow encoded or encrypted as it's uh, being passed over the network. Server identifies itself that it's calling back to as a net support gateway. You know, once again, just because it's Net Support Manager doesn't mean it's necessarily malicious. I just uh, wouldn't want it running on my network. 
talking to my, uh, uh, you know, like I own those Windows hosts. And once again, we have another Windows executable file that's uh, showing up uh, as an alert, as a policy alert. It's smaller than one megabyte. Possibly malware. Let's check it out. We can filter. Let's filter on uh, HTTP and that IP address. 136.243.158.225. IP address equals that and HTTP. Pardon? Well, that's true, and, and you could easily use that trick that, uh, uh, that you're describing that we talked about earlier. IP contains in quotation marks of this program, and uh, see if you get it. But uh, there's something I want to point out here. Uh, in addition, all right. First thing, we have three TCP streams. We basically have two uh, port pairs where the source port is, uh, in one case, is 49211, in the second case is 49212, and in the third case is 49213. So we have uh, three TCP streams. The URL is a very long URL with a lot of, uh, a lot of random looking characters in it. If you look at the HTTP header, uh, uh, the response, the uh, codes, they're all 200 OKs, and the first two of them One's identified as application slash x dash ms dash dash program, another indicator that that's a Windows executable. And then you have the second one here, which is the one I'm more concerned with. That says application slash octet stream. And that's another one that I'm, you know, I'll, I'll see this included with Windows executables and in some other things, which we're going to find out here just momentarily. Anyway, uh, so application architect stream, application whatever we uh, saw earlier, MS-DOS program. So what I would like you to do is select this particular one, the uh, port pair that starts with the second pair with the source port as 49212. Follow that TCP stream, please. Follow it, and I would like to see what, uh, what you're seeing here. Actually, is that it? The very second one. Let me see what you got. Follow that second, yeah, that second HTTP request, follow TCP stream. Okay. <coughs> And then maybe follow HTTP stream to see if that makes a difference in the way it's displayed. Because what, uh, what I find with this, and that may be like a, uh, a, a different archive, but the first pair, this HTTP request and response, that returns an executable for Net Support Manager RAT. The second one generally returns some sort of uh, archive in this case, it may be a 7-zip archive uh, um, of the configuration files that set it up specifically for this criminal group. And then uh, the third one is just uh, some information, I think, that uh, once it gets the stuff sent over. Pardon? The script. Ah, thank you. So once again, if we go to File, Export Objects, HTTP, we can export that particular one, that very first uh, application MS, X MS-DOS program, 578 kilobytes. At the very end, it says uh, 7za.exe. we got like three and a half minutes left, so... I don't really have time to dig into it as much as I would like. So you could export that. Um, if you export that in Windows, I, I don't know that it would delete it because technically it's not malware. 
then feel free to submit that to virus total. It's probably already in virus total as a result. And then you can confirm that that's net support manager rat. But uh, let's move on real quick. We got a couple of minutes. I had 15 minutes more today than yesterday, and I'm almost at the same point I was you know, when I did that uh, previous training class. So, that, that lab. So, uh, fifth PCAP. This is Emotet. This is the environment where this uh, fictional company is topiarydream.com. And our host, where we have the alerts, is 10.14.2.204. Okay, here are the alerts. The alerts that we have, we see a few of them that are post-infection check-in traffic uh, by Emotet malware. The first alert is a uh, office document download. The second alert is a Windows executable file or DLL being downloaded. So it follows the general infection path that we see for Emotet malware infection. Somebody gets an email, it has a link. They click on the link thinking it's an invoice, it's a Word document. It says, hey, in order to see the contents of this document, you got to enable macros. Because they're no dummies. They know that Microsoft, even, uh, you know, even though they do a lot of things wrong when it comes to security, in my opinion, they at least disable macros. And then you enable macros, and then it retrieves the, the Emotet executable and infects the computer. So one of the things with this particular PCAT is if you start on HTTP request, you get a lot of blue results in here that are for UDP port 1900, which is uh, plug and play, I think, uh, associated traffic, somebody was saying yesterday. I don't know what it is, but I just know it's annoying, and I see it all the time. So I'll filter it out. So an easy way to filter that stuff out if you want to get a, a good look at it, instead of uh, that, just uh, HTTP request and uh, exclamation point in uh, parentheses, put in UDP. You could probably do it without the parentheses, but I always use the parentheses because usually I'll have a, a larger parameter that I want to exclude from my results. So I, I could just get in the habit of doing that. I'm going to take us right up to 6 o'clock here. Still show about two and a half minutes. All right, so here's the long and the short of it. Once you filter on HTTP.request and not UDP, you'll see after MSFT and CSI, that, that first HTTP request, that's a normal uh, uh, traffic generated by Windows, uh, Windows host when it uh, gets onto a network right after you log in. So that MSFT and CSI, that's normal. It, um, I've never seen that be bad in my limited experience. Uh, so your first two HTTP requests, the first one is the Word document, the second one is after they enable the macros is the Emotet executable. Once again, we can go to the file, export objects, HTTP. And once again, we can save each one of these. We can save that first one, which should be the MS uh, Microsoft Word document, and the second one, which should be the Windows executable, that's the Emotet malware. You save that. You can uh, check the file, uh, do a file command if you're in a, uh, uh, a command line environment that supports the file command. And you can uh, uh, get file hashes, search those against virus total. You should find both of those are clearly identified in virus total. For example, the Word doc generally has comments for, for any time I've seen Emotet uh, malware. And those, those spam waves come every day, every day. Uh, even through the weekends, there'll be some new stuff that comes out. But it, you know, it really, on the, Monday through Friday, just literally, I, if I spent all day doing this stuff, I could collect uh, hundreds of URLs on new sites I'd never seen before. It's amazing the number of websites that are out there. It's almost an infinite supply of uh, places that uh, criminals can host their malware on. 
You can go to the community tab for this uh, particular Word document. If you're able to extract that, submit it to VirusTotal, it should come right up because it's already been submitted. Go to the community tab and you would see that people have already tagged this email tab. So that's one way of confirming if you've been hit by some sort of commodity malware is to use VirusTotal. It's a very valuable tool. And in this case, uh, the one entry is payload security. So it's got a URL that you could go to. You can't just click on it. You actually have to kind of copy and paste it over. You can go into uh, that URL, which is uh, a Sandbox, hybrid analysis, hybrid-analysis.com which is the same as reverse.it. Different names, same exact sandbox. Um, I think uh, CrowdStrike uh, bought this. And you can go through and uh, you know, it says Emotet right here. It may or may not have actual Windows traffic that uh, uh, post-infection traffic that matches what you have in your PCAP. And we have officially run out of time. I can go through these last slides if you guys want to hang around, but I think at 6.15 we're supposed to show up for the instructor uh, pictures. Uh, if you guys want to hang around, if you guys got places to be, you're, you're not going to insult me at all if you got to leave. I'd feel bad if I were keeping you here against your will. 6PCAP. This is TrickBot. TrickBot is another backdoor information stealer type Trojan. So what we're looking at, this domain is called chompware.net. Here's your IP address. This is very much, uh, very similar to uh, what we had with Emotet, where you've got a, uh, a, a download of a Word document. It's the same infection path, um, and there's an email involved, so you generally don't see that initial, uh, what's usually a Word document that you have to enable macros. Then it uh, grabs the TrickBot executable. Now, TrickBot is generally encrypted uh, post-infection traffic, and it's got some interesting HTTP traffic on TCP port 8082. And that just started within the past month or two. Because before that, it was just all encrypted over uh, non-standard uh, and standard uh, ports for HTTPS. So if you filter on SSL handshake type equals one and you have a slightly outdated version of Wireshark that I'm using here, uh, you're not gonna see the HTTPS uh, traffic come up, the results come up on uh, when you're filtering on the SSL handshake type equals one. So you would actually have to set up a uh, custom uh, decoding. So under analyze, decode as, Bring us up a window. So analyze, decode as. Everybody sees that? They'll bring up your decode as window. Wireshark's very helpful because it's got a little plus sign where you could add a value. When you click that, uh, make sure your field is a TCP port. Make sure your port is 447 in this case. And then you've got uh, default, you've got your default uh, um, uh, decoding, and then you've got your current decoding, which in this case should, should both be none. You're going to go to current, you're going to pop up the menu, you're going to scroll down to SSL. Once you do that, save it. Don't OK, save it, and then OK. Because it may not, uh, if, if you, from what I've seen in some cases, when you click OK, and then you close Wireshark, and then open up another PCAP, uh, restarts it, it may not save uh, across that. So make sure you save it so you've got it in your list. And now when we filter on SSL handshake type, we see the port 447 traffic listed and that results. And this is a little bit, there should be a in parenthesis over here. I'm sorry, over here. So you put an SSL uh, uh, handshake type equals one or HTTP request in parentheses or, I'm sorry, and not UDP because I don't want to see that UDP port 1900 traffic. So with the exception of all the uh, Windows update traffic, 
I can get a good idea. I can see, well, there's the MSFT NCSI, but I can see this thing, which is an HTTP request for the TrickBot binary. Okay, I know it because I've seen it often enough, and that is what the, uh, uh, the alert for the uh, Windows executable or DLL download, that policy alert was for. This uh, other one is some of the post-infection traffic uh, as it calls back to the server and gives information about the, uh, about the host that's infected. MAC addresses, uh, it basically does, uh, 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 runs a bunch of command line uh, commands and, and just ports all the results in a big old text file to the command control server. This is, uh, this is if you were to select this result, to uh, the HTTP POST request to uh, port uh, 8082. You follow that TCP stream, this is what we're looking at. So first, uh, it does a process list to show all the running processes. You scroll down, it does a sysinfo command to get all the information on your infected Windows host. Now I, I edit these PCAPs, so this is, uh, that's not the actual serial number uh, and uh, some of the other stuff. What I'm l lucky is, uh, for some reason, it says the build type is multiprocessor free, and this is a dual core VM. And uh, it says that the, ins the install date, for some reason, defaults to 1899, which is fine with me. I don't want them knowing you know, my actual installation date. And you've got uh, a bunch of other st information where, in this case, the uh, Windows account name is Shavanda Armijo. I'm pronouncing that wrong, I'm sure. That's pretty much it. Thank you guys.